that have been signed during this summit, but a, a number of other uh, uh, areas of, of, of communality as well, to work with Indian scientific community, to work on breakthroughs in agriculture, to work with India on breakthroughs in, in medicine. We see this at, at the high levels of, of, of global partnership, but also at the level of actual practical progress in dealing with some of the fundamental issues that, that our world has to deal with right. at, at a very pragmatic this, level. Uh, support on the civil nuclear treaty, I don't yes. think really the, the Indian community in the U.S. made an enormous contribution and a great role in getting that over the line when it was... And getting getting that, getting that particular... It's a issue too because it develops that trust mm -hmm. at a, and not just at a government level but at a personal level. <laughs> right, so that was to the good and the civil nuclear deal obviously helped move India into a slightly better position and got one of the major problems out. But Sir Martin, I just wanted to come back to the point that, that Mr. Banga was making just a short while back. There are still many areas where India needs to, to do things and where the world is expecting mm -hmm. India to be part of the solution and even if it is not, not part sure. of the problem. Climate is one of them. Sure. Trade is another. Sure. And there could be a number of other issues. Iran could be a, could be yeah, a third. Well, well I, the thing I wanted to just uh, inject was that if you control, you know, I've always thought about why it was that, that India took off at the time that it did. And obviously, there, if you go back through the history in the 90s, there are a number of significant political, economic, and social changes that trigger that. But I always thought that neighborhood envy, if you looked at the rise of the, the Chinese tiger, that that... That, that exerted an influence and pushed politicians, with all due respect, and others to focus on the issue. And coming back to this... Uh, so if I could just interrupt you, that's an, that's an interesting point you're making. You're saying the fact that China really took off almost propelled in, in well, India I, I think into it, not wanting you know, to be Deng Xiaoping's behind. speech in 85 and the, the measure that you know, we've been... You know, we, we've been alive at WPP for 25 years, and for, for 22 of those, 23 of those 25 years, you know, we've had we've had significant operations uh, in India and China, and we were blessed, really, by, by half by chance as a result of that. But the point I'm making is this: that that, and I think India is. And again, I don't want to be critical because there's a lot going on, there's a lot to be done, and there's a lot of internal things that have to be done, whether it be education, development of people, although with a 1.1, 1.2 billion people population base, the world is Indian's oyster. But it has, I think India has to become more externally focused. And the, the, the issue is this, China has subtly, whilst the West have been focused on Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, China has started to, to spread soft diplomatic issues influence throughout the world. You see it in Africa, you see it in Latin America, you see it in Asia generally. It's not just the, the contiguous countries, not just the region that we're talking about. Uh, and I think India as a world power, I mean my view is this is a 200 year swing. Go back to the early 19th century, go back to 1825, uh, and India and China accounted for 40% of worldwide GMP. You know, according to Goldman's uh, uh, prognostications or other forecasts by 2040 or 50, we'll be back to that. And the BRICS and the next 11 would be back to 50% of worldwide GMP, which again is where they were 200 years ago. So history was, wasn't on the side of India and China for 200 years. It, now, I don't know if it's going to be another 200 years, but it will be now. This is an in, inexorable force. This is unstoppable in my view. And there's a major shift and we in the West have to come to terms with that and have to understand it. So, But India will have as a result of this, very significant external responsibility as well, which I think, uh, and having said that, there's a lot to do. A lot to do internally and externally. Anand, the, the external responsibilities, I know, you know for example, uh, we had uh, Jairam Ramesh saying India wants to be a deal maker now at global forums and not a deal breaker. Is that something that you think is really crucial and really important going forward? A again, it is something which would change the way that India is, is presenting itself internally because politicians sometimes within India have a problem in saying we are changing our position on global fora. Why has India changed its stance? Sometimes you may have to change that stance if you want to play a, a, a leadership uh, role at a global level. Well, I, I just have a little trepidation about trying to interpret the meaning of the word deal maker, particularly what Jairam meant by that. There could be a lot of pejorative connotations to that. But I, let me put it in a different way. I think India wants to be part of the spec sheet when the spec sheet is being set. That's a very mundane business phrase. But the question is, are you there when the terms are being set? 
for dialogue, for negotiation, for any major global issue. Okay. And if you really coalesce everything that this panel has said, and everything happens, whether it's win these points or it's about infrastructure, middle class growth, which Rajat said, there is no way that the world can keep India out from being on the table when those terms of trade are set. I just want to make one very quick point, which uh, Zakir mentioned earlier. Zakir, you talked about needing India to be to create a multiplier. You can create a multiplier only when there's interconnectedness, when two countries are part of each other's value chains or supply chains. And from a very ground level view, as a company, we've been trying to sell in Pakistan for a while. And in fact, I got the crazy answer last year in Davos from one of your policy makers saying, you know, you can sell from your tractors, from your, from your company in China or the US, I can't let you sell from India. How are we being given an opportunity to build a multiplier if the doors are shut? Okay. I believe the case is that Pakistani businessmen are worried about being inundated. I, I think there should be more confidence. I'm willing to play and see who wins or loses. Okay, before I turn to Facebook, you want to quickly respond to that. Are the neighbor, India's neighbors sometimes worried about being completely swamped by India? Uh, no, I don't think so. So I think uh, there is a possibility, there's so much that we can do in terms of trade and Pakistani businessmen, I can say that for certainty, are actually looking for opportunity to export into India. They feel that's a very large market and there are economies of scale that they can achieve for their own products. So I think there, if the politicians say that, I'd say I think the business community needs to do some more convincing of that. But there is this whole issue of bilateral <coughs> relations which I think need to be addressed. And uh, that's a subject for the politicians too. All right. I, I just want to move away from the panel for a couple of minutes because we've heard what the panel has been saying, but we've also been asking uh, some of the questions to all uh, the people out there in the world on Facebook and also on NDTV.com. I'd just like to welcome onto the program, onto the show, Randy Zuckerberg, who's, uh, I mean, we, we, we all know what her, what her brother Mark has done with Facebook, but in many ways, Randy is now the, the face of Facebook, if I can call her that. Andy, you did a special poll on this subject on Facebook. What was it and what did you find? That's right. So this is clearly an issue that many people are passionate around the world and over the past few days we've been asking Facebook users all over the world what they think, uh, what should the world expect from India. Um, it's interesting, uh, a lot of people on the panel mentioned leadership in major areas. Something that we only lightly touched on was climate change, but uh, overwhelmingly that was the response that most of people on Facebook thought that the world should expect from India was to be a leader in climate change over the next few years across every age group, that was unanimously the uh, majority answer. Right, Randy. Uh, solving the problem of global poverty got about 19%, acting as an engine of economic growth got about 13%, but cooperating on global issues was the big one. That's right. You did ask a couple of other questions, Andy, and I'm going to come back to those in a, in a couple of minutes. But Minister, I can just get, get your reaction to this. It comes back to that, that point which I was making earlier about wanting to be a deal maker on big global, global issues. Uh, is that something where you think India has been, um, I don't want to use the words obstructionist, but we, I, I, when we landed here at Davos, was, there was an article that we read in Foreign Policy that said India is holding up too many international treaties. Is that a fair comment to make and is it true and particularly in your ministry when it comes to trade? Well, uh, I do not know if there is selective amnesia on the part of the author because India has taken major initiatives. There was the Doha round of the WTO which was stalled for 15 months, frozen literally. I'm not going into the merits or demerits whether we were right or the others were wrong. When countries negotiate a multilateral treaty or a regime, they come from different levels of development, different aspirations and their national positions. And that's where you meet, talk and try to find a common middle ground. India took the initiative to re-energize the Doha process by convening the ministerial in Delhi in the first week of September. Uh, it was a rainbow coalition put together, not our key partners in the developing countries, all the caucuses, but key interlocutors of the developed uh, world, whether it's the US or Canada, Japan, uh, and EU. And we, we were responsible, which has been acknowledged in the G20 Pittsburgh summit, that talks have resumed, negotiators returned to Geneva, and today text-based negotiations are proceeding. And Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh was very happy. I was not there in Pittsburgh. Montek was there. He's here. But 
that is what we can do okay but I, we I, cannot I we cannot decide for 153 countries we can only take a leader's initiative and quickly i would like to also mention that it's not only on trade and climate change it's not a question of deal making deal is no is how you harmonize position in the larger good of humankind and planet earth same goes for trade so that you bring about a trade regime which is truly global uh, which which addresses the legitimate aspirations and challenges also the developing countries and the poor countries because poverty is very high on your agenda and we are in 2010 and let's not forget the millennium summit and the millennium development goals so i would rather